Uh, so I'm Karen Marie Eust, and I am the facilitator for this panel this afternoon, evening, uh, morning, wherever you are. Um, and I'm not going to kick us off by asking each of our um, panelists to say just a few words about who they are and where they're located um, so that you'll have a sense of the um, places that they come from as they then consider several questions in relationship to the role of parents and caregivers in the spiritual and religious nurture of children and families. Uh, so let's kick it off with Brad, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Karen Marie. Uh, I'm Brad Wigger. Um, normally, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm a professor of Christian education at Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Um, I'm currently in New York City uh, because I'm doing research uh, very relevant to um, the, the panel topic today. I, uh, before the pandemic began, I, I began a research project where I was interviewing children and parents, um, almost all Christian, church-based, uh, but interviewing them about their uh, religious lives, um, their beliefs and practices, uh, both children by themselves, um, to hear how they think about God and church and things like that, uh, but also parents and some grandparents as well, interviewing them uh, about the intersection be between their faith lives um, and uh, their parenting lives. Uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. Dua? Hi, everyone. My name is Dua, Dua Hagag. I reside in Michigan, greater Flint area. I work as an LPC with uh, children and adolescents and their families. The majority of my clients are Muslim. Um, I also work, i um, pretty active with the Muslim American Society with a specific organization or program that we call Family Odyssey, where we get families to come together and learn from one another through experiential um, activities, intergenerational experiential activities. And I'm glad to be here with all of you. Thanks. Erin? Thank you, Karen Marie. I'm Aaron Weininger. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I am the senior rabbi of the Adaf Yashurin congregation in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, we're a congregation of 1,100 households uh, that spans uh, the life cycle from uh, birth uh, through death. And uh, we're able to serve um, a variety of the Jewish community as we identify with the conservative movement, big C conservative movement of Judaism. Um, part of my experience coming uh, to this panel is my work with Search Institute, which is based here in Minneapolis and work uh, that we did right before COVID on um, the intersection of youth development and spiritual community, uh, parenting adults and kids and how a spiritual community shows up in their lives. Thank you. And uh, now, Elaine. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here and to be with you today. My name is Hélène Champagne. I'm of French speaking, so I already apologize if I do some mistakes. I'm usually living in Quebec City. Today, I'm in Montreal, where there is a huge storm. I'm a professor of uh, spirituality and theological spirituality. Um, my specialty is with children's spirituality, and I'm chair uh, of religion, spirituality, and health. And so, again, sp uh, specialized in children's spirituality and mostly in uh, palliative care. I've been working as a chaplain a long time ago for a few years in a pediatric hospital, and uh, my research are, um, continue in that field. Thank you. So we're going to start our conversation um, now thinking about what are the expectations that we might have of parents and other caregivers regarding children's spiritual nurture. Um, and that might involve thinking about um, how we actually talk about nurturing spirituality with caregivers um, uh, or with parents in the home. 
um, how we see the role of parents, how parents see the role of parents in the spiritual nurture process, uh, what children expect from parents in the spiritual nurture process, um, and even if there's ways in which that role evolves over time. Um, and then since Elaine is in a place where there might be storms and we're a little nervous about her losing power, I'm gonna ask her if she would respond first to the question, what are our expectations of parents and other caregivers when it comes to children's spiritual nurture? I really like this question. And when I reflected upon it, my first um, reflections, my first reactions were thinking about what parents and what caregivers would hope and would uh, would expect actually about the children's spirituality. And I believe that all parents, when they confront situation where their children are sick, uh, they hope of for the well-being of their children, of course. Okay, so there is a great hope for the well-being of their, their child, uh, a hope for their development. Um, sometimes uh, parents in Quebec, especially uh, in modern society, they are suspicious of institutions, but they are, they are trusting people. They're, they put their trust in people, and this person or that person can be a support spiritually, psychologically, socially, uh, fr uh, with friendship, with presence, uh, things like that. Um, I, I read an article from a, a researcher called Annie Janvier, who is, she's a doctor in pediatrics, and she was exploring parents' hope facing their child's um, birth or their newborn's birth when in very severe genetic condition. And the staff was very worried that parents would have uh, irrealistic or unrealistic uh, expectancies and that they would hope that their child would survive this critical situation or that they would live for a long time, even in a very dramatic and serious condition. And when Annie uh, asked parents about their hopes, their expectancies, what they would be, what would be their, their deepest um, dreams about what is going to happen to them. And surprisingly, many of them answered very simple things like meeting their child or being a family together just for a few moments, if so, or going home, being at home with the child for a few hours, maybe, but just feeling as a family together, feeling connected, being there for the child, being present, feeling its presence as well, and, and meeting who is this little person that that is new to them and, and being with them, being together, feeling connected. Other research, uh, I think of Jose Menard, she talked about uh, parents hoping that their children, very sick children with complex sickness, would just feel loved, that they would get the most of their lives, that they would feel that they would belong, that they experience a certain normality. That would be their hope. And I believe that these hopes are very, very spiritual. That's what I would like to say for now. Thank you, Elaine. Erin, what thoughts do you have on this question of expectations for parents and caregivers with regard to their children's spiritual nurture? One of the questions I tend to ask when I'm meeting with parents, parenting adults, is um, when did you stop being kids? Uh, at what point did you stop being kids? And it always leads to a really interesting conversation about the alignment or misalignment uh, between kids' spirituality and their adults' spirituality. Uh, and one of, one of the qualities I love about kids' spirituality is the uninhibited nature for our congregation. It's kids running on what we call the BIMA, the raised platform of our service, feeling uninhibited to dance and to sing and to play by the ark and to do that as if no one is watching them. At some point in our development, we become aware that other people are watching us and paying attention. And I think that quote unquote gets in the way of a lot in life. It can also be helpful with a lot in life, but with spirituality, I think it hinders the expression of parents, of adults who have spirituality too. And um, we have kids who eagerly get up in services and dance and participate and seem to love that. And I think it's essential for us that parents are given space um, to talk about being uncomfortable doing that. And that's not everyone's jam and that's okay. Uh, but to be able to express what feels true. Uh, there are also 
um, parents I meet who talk about the time when they were, you know, 10 or 11 and the religious leader in their community stopped the service and shouted at them because they were making too much noise. Uh, and the power of memory uh, in carrying that for a lifetime, that can also inhibit um, or, or really change the way in which adult spirituality is engaged. And so the more that I as a religious leader, the more that others can create spaces in which um, kids and their adults are experiencing services, learning together, um, and then finding moments for kids' experiences and adult experiences, and naming those dynamics um, to me has been important and allows for the flourishing each in their own way um, to have a developed, evolving uh, religious and spiritual life. Thanks, Erin. Duov, what are some of your thoughts on this? So I, I also work as a community educator for the Family and Youth Institute. And sometimes when I'm giving workshops or presentations to parents, parents will approach me or approach the workshop thinking, I'm not sure they they feel uncomfortable or anxious or worried about creating a space and a framework for their children to be connected spiritually with this idea that there's a higher power. And when I think of expectations of parents to create that sense of spirituality in that in, in their children is to provide that space, that framework, that understanding that there's something bigger than life. Um, I think there's a sense of safety um, instilling that in our children, having them understand that it's not just, you know, the, 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 just the interactions that we have with individuals on the earth in front of us, but also that there's a greater plan. Um, and so in our daily activities and our daily affirmations and the interactions that we have with our children, to be able to remind them and to connect them with this idea that there is a greater or a higher power in everything that they do and in their experiences and sensory experiences in all that they do as children. Um, there's, there's a saying that we have in our tradition that says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, and what that means is, to God we belong and to him we return. So this idea of this circle of life, because sometimes as parents, we get so anxious that we have to be the ones that are in charge and in control, but to really instill in our children that when we're gone and when we're not there anymore and you do become adults and you're out there in the world, there's something greater than just your parents or the immediate family that you have. And Brad, I know this has been an interest of yours for quite a while too. Uh, your thoughts on what our expectations are? Yeah, I would. Um, I'm, I'm basing most of what I'm going to talk about today on the the research we've been doing, um, and we've interviewed in a lot of different communities. Uh, again, um, mostly Christian, but pretty wide variety within uh, Christian traditions. So um, we've interviewed. In the Orthodox community, in uh, Jesus, uh, Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints, a lot of mainline Protestants, which is my home territory, um, evangelical to progressive, uh, so kind of all over the place. Um, and it really, uh, I would talk, I would think about this. I think I do think about this question in relation to how uh, parents themselves. Um, how much responsibility they put on themselves. The ones we've been talking to have been highly engaged in a community, in a congregation. Um, some will talk about really relying heavily upon that congregation um, to help nurture that spiritual life, not just what happens in worship, but the other people involved, intergenerational relationships, peer relationships. Um, some will rely heavily that way, but others put a whole lot of responsibility on themselves and feel like, you know, this really is my um, my responsibility to to uh, raise this child in faith uh, and so that they have faith. And that can be a really daunting responsibility when you think you're at it all alone, kind of like what you were talking about, Dua. Um, so, um, People who, and then I've heard a lot of stories, people kind of started out that way and then relied even more heavily on the congregation because of other parents, because they can't do it themselves, uh, because they discovered their own finitude uh, in the midst of the struggles of 
of being a parent. So that's kind of on the one side, and different communities have different um, different expectations. So um, the Latter Day Saint community, they there's a huge emphasis on what happens at home, nightly devotions, prayer. Uh, they write curricula for the home, um, and others, other denominations don't pay as much attention to that. One other angle on this question uh, that that relates to the, the interviews that we've done with parents, we one of our questions is why do you take your children to church? Um, why why in the in the universe of things you can do, you don't have to do that. Um, but there were there were several kind of categories of answers. One, they wanted to be part of a larger community for all the reasons I was just talking about. Some really like just the structure and routine. It's helpful when you have especially young kids. Um, some talk about kind of a moral foundation. Others talk about identity issues of faith. For them. They want their children to think of themselves as people of faith. But I would say the overwhelming answer across different communities was um, love, that they that these parents wanted their children to know God's love, to know that they are loved, that they, um, that again, that there's something larger than even my parental love um, that, that holds you and holds your life. Um, and in turn, um, that they they want they want their children to know the the ways of love of loving others being kind and compassionate to others. So I'll I'll stop there. Let's continue this thread of thought. Um, Dua or Elaine or Aaron, are there things that you've observed or that you hear from parents that they say about why they care that their children have a spiritual or religious life experience? or what it is that they're seeking for their children when they um, find themselves in one of these um, difficult times at the pediatric hospital, or they are coming to uh, the synagogue or mosque or, or participating in a religious community. What are you all hearing from children? Um, just uh, signal which of you wants to speak and I'll call you out. Elaine. Maybe I can say a few words. Actually, it's true that uh, population in Quebec, as in every other places, uh, is very diverse. So I cannot answer for one type of parents or it's very diverse. Sometimes parents are very religious and this sense of transcendence or, or of something uh, greater than us is very present. But in many times, they don't know. They are not um, informed or they don't have the knowledge. The young generations don't necessarily have the knowledge or the, the experience of religious practices or, and, or, or specific traditions. And so they are exploring spirituality and spirituality might be to them something more like a, a posture of being than uh, something that also connect them to others and rituals and something greater than them. So it's, it's complex because it's very diverse what we can encounter. I would say that in this context, uh, there is a certain discomfort um, with existential questions. Uh, why suffering? Why death? And love seems to be very rapidly said, but it's, it's so deep an answer because probably it's what they have left. It's, it's something ultimate. It's something very deep to them and very important. I remember a small story, and that will be the end of my comment for this time, of a, a young father who was at the uh, intensive, uh, intensive uh, neonatal intensive care unit. And his wife was in the hospital and his child was in a different hospital and he was with his child. And I was chaplain at that time and I was visiting him and just uh, asking what's, what was going on. I was referred to him and explore with him what was going on. And he told me that his wife was in a very critical situation, his child as well. They were in different spaces, uh, places and it was uh, uh, um, tormenting and it was tearing him apart. 
And I asked him if he believes or if, if there was a connection uh, with something greater than him, with transcendence. And he answered me, no, no, I don't believe in God or anything like that. And he pondered and he said to me, but, but I believe my grandmother does. And that's important because that will nurture and help the child. And so I just listened to him and he said, you know, I believe that maybe connection or belief in God comes with age because my mother, she's just retired and she, she's going back to church these days. And so I believe that when I'm getting old, I will believe in God. And I found that fantastic because although he was not considering himself religious, if he had this confidence or trust in his family, in his mother, grandmother, in something greater, even though it was not from him, but through the others, through um, intercession, and this would help his child. That's my comment for now. That's amazing. And it brings in this sense of the extended family too. Um, mm -hmm. Aaron or Dua, do you want to talk about things you've heard parents say or even uh, comment further on this notion of extended family and how they might play in? Sure, I can I can jump in. So I really like this story that you shared, Elaine, particularly this trust in not just the, you know, just this older person that has that kind of knowledge and that wisdom. Um, oftentimes when when young people come in, they often share, oh, you know, I'm the whole religious thing. I'm not I'm not a part of, you know, I'm not really interested. I'm not but there's still some kind of a connection that they see through people. And I think I, I strongly believe that young people's understanding of transcendence or God or this higher power comes from their relationships with the elders that are around them and the people that are around them. If the people that are around them are very harsh and authoritarian and, you know, the way that they interact with them can be very strict, then oftentimes how they think of this higher power could be in the same light. So I often tell families and, and parents and caregivers, the way that you interact with your children is how they will view that higher power, how they will view spirituality. If you're merciful, they will think of that as being something merciful, right? Um, and if you, if you, if you ex exude love and you show that love, that's the connection that they'll, that, that they'll make. And I would, I also add like another layer, not just the human beings that are around them, but their exposure to other creations and how they kind of go through their daily living. So in our tradition, we think of birds as a really great example of a creation that shows us this reliance on this higher power, that this the birds will, will fly in the morning not knowing where their sustenance is, right? Not knowing where their blessings are. Their stomachs are empty, but when they come back, their stomachs are full, right? And to use those examples that we see in everyday living, whether it's through animals or trees or the creations that are around us or human beings and the relationships that we have with these human beings to help young people understand their connection with that higher power. I'd be Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, glad to, to jump in here. Uh, I think there's so many ways into this uh, particular question and the ways in which um, Jewish communities experienced or identities experienced and cultivated uh, through spiritual practice, uh, just reflecting on the last year, um, you know, in the Jewish community, anti-Semitic incidents in the U.S. rose by 36 percent, and uh, there were about close to 4,000 incidents of harassment, vandalism, assaults targeting Jewish people in communities, uh, and so at all of our uh, Shabbat, all of our, our Sabbath worship services, we have uh, security officers, and so kids are raised in our communities very aware of um, the presence of security um, and are asking questions and asking questions that many parents um, don't feel prepared to answer um, and bring up anxiety in parents in ways in which um, just yesterday there was a, a drone spotted um, in our parking lot and that set off a great deal of anxiety um, that connects to anti-Semitism uh, and on the one hand can cement a deep sense of pride in religious identification, um, participation, uh, and saying, I'm Jewish and I'm here. 
um, but it also uh, creates at times a culture of fear and anxiety um, and a culture of solidarity. Uh, in 2016, in the heat of the presidential election, um, our synagogue partnered with um, our friends at the Northwest Islamic Community Center, um, as there were so many Islamophobic and hateful comments being made. And we felt a responsibility knowing what it's like to be the target of anti-Semitism to not just look out for, for our Jewish community, but to say we're in solidarity and solidarity means showing up and speaking out and modeling for our kids the kind of faith community we wanna build here in Minneapolis. And so um, we had different exchange events. We had um, a, a ceremony concluding Shabbat and it's a very short ceremony. Many uh, Jewish services tend to be very long. Uh, this one is about 10 minutes and we invited um, our local Muslim community to come and experience that service and to join us in doing a tour of the building and having dessert and welcoming people into our social hall. And several months later, we were, as a Jewish community in our synagogue, welcomed to um, the, the Northwest Islamic Community Center and were greeted with such hospitality and warmth. Uh, and, and those were kid-centered events, uh, really on the experience of kids coming up to the ark, kids touching the Torah scroll, uh, kids leading the service, and, and the same with, with our partners at the Islamic Center, um, kids from that community were essential in creating the arts and crafts projects in playing games uh, and really centering the experience of kids um, in some ways gives permission to adults to ask questions, to name discomfort, to talk about fears and doing that in multi-faith settings um, and being involved in the Collegeville Institute here similarly, doing kind of multi-faith work and building that into um, who we are as a community has enabled parents uh, both within our own faith community and then our cross faith community um, to get together for play dates. And you know, while kids are playing to have conversations that otherwise don't get to happen. And that's been really enriching for our community as a whole. Thank you. That gets me thinking about, you know, what is it that children and youth are expecting from others in terms of spiritual nurture, whether they would use that terminology or not? Do any of you um, or all of you have a sense of some of the things that children long for or desire from the adults around them that we might call spiritual or religious nurture? Um, again, just uh, unmute and jump in or I'll start calling on people if no one does. I see Elaine is unmuted. Oh, that's a mistake. <laughs> Let me think for a few seconds. I can jump in. So I, I think with young people, um, oftentimes they're thinking, does it have to be all or nothing? Does everything have to be so black and white? Right. And oftentimes when I, I, you know, talk with young people, I'm like, no, just take the baby steps, right? Do the little things. And, um, you know, God or whatever higher power you believe in uh, is if you come to him walking, he'll come to you running, right? Those little baby steps are really, really important. And it gives them a sense of, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can handle this, right? Um, and it, it could just be as simple as raising your hands and asking God for help, right? Just those little, really small things. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just the little steps to feel like there's there's someone who has your back. I, I, uh, I can jump in with um, a couple of thoughts about what I've heard children say they appreciate um, about um, especially the adults in their lives through their their um, through their congregations um, and it's often very very simple what we would think of as very simple um, qualities but it's often just things like paying attention listening not um, not dismissing too easily um, something that the child says um, some kids will talk about um, um, so-and-so, you know, she listened to me tell a story while I was doing handstands. I mean, it was just these weird, just not uh, programmed conversations 
I mean, good things happen in, in some of these schools and religious education as well, but it, it was often the, the kind of spontaneous unplanned stuff that's around the edges of the more formal structured uh, things as well. So I do, and I, and I think parents appreciate that for their children, uh, especially if they don't have a lot of um, family support in their areas. So the, that there are surrogate grandparents and surrogate aunts and uncles and older brothers and sisters and that sort of thing. Um, the other area that I'll jump in on a little bit is, uh, again, an appreciation of um, the role of the older, uh, an older generation grandparents. Uh, I, I've been, we've been exploring more and more um, the role of grandparents either actually raising their children because the parents' lives have fallen apart in some way or another. Um, so that then the grandparents have actually been doing the day-to-day -day, um, parenting, raising of children. Um, and that's one kind of um, role that grandparents uh, we talked to have played. But the other is a kind of um, the parents' um, spiritual lives are in some kind of flux or, um, or unknowingness, or maybe a job gets in the way of being able to uh, take their kids to services. Uh, and so then the grandparents have been stepping in and taking children, uh, in my case, to, to churches. Um, and that's really an interesting process. And it's very, the, the grandparents themselves find that very meaningful. Uh, it's one thing for the parents to do that. Um, but when there's that extra layer, um, like all, <laughs> I'm a grandparent, so I can talk about this. Um, but there's just another having that extra distance of not having to, to fret about the day-to-day -day things uh, lets you kind of relax in uh, your relationship with your grandkids even more. And then I think when you compound that with a, a kind of spiritual role too, I think it, it can become very powerful for both the child and the grandparent. That's that reminds me of another story of a, a grandmother who told me that it was Christmas time and her granddaughter uh, was playing with the nativity um, uh, little people and the crèche. And the mother was not a believer, never talked about uh, Jesus or anything with her daughter. And uh, the grandmother tells the nativity story and then the child plays with the pieces. And the, mother, the grandmother had put them as it's usually told, and the child just changed the place. And so the grandmother spontaneously replaced them correctly, and the child does it again. So the grandmother asked the child, what are you doing? And the child put all the people in circle. And she said, why do you do that? And the child answered, well, because they love each other. It was obvious to her. So what would be the children's expectations? That, would, that was the questions that I remember. And I would say they would hope uh, maybe a space for expression. And we talked a lot about this in the previous uh, conferences that I heard this week. Maybe they would hope to, to hear the truth. And that is a tricky question. What is truth? Uh, not a theoretical truth, but a sincere, authentic truth. What, what do you believe about this topic or about this question about how do you live this? How do you face this? This is truth, I believe. Um, and, and I'm thinking also about very serious questions again about uh, sickness, about suffering, about that. And I was... Um, writing a few years ago, I wrote um, a uh, uh, four meetings with children and catechists uh, about the Paschal mystery. And children were meeting people from the Bible, obviously actors, and they could interact with them. And at one point in those meetings, they were supposed to enter a grotto, and that grotto represented both Lazarus' grotto, uh, Lazarus' tomb, but also Jesus' tomb. And children would see, I'm trying to make that very clear and short, they would see pictures of the Anastasi. 
and anastasi is a word that is used in greek christianity to to describe jesus going to the dead and pull them back to life and so ch children would see pictures of that and would be called out and when we presented that activity to catechists they said no way because there was a point with they would where they would ask children did you ever talk about what is that and all the catechists were frozen and they said never i will do that because that that this the parents will be against us what the children will think they will be afraid we don't want to touch that topic at all and so we discussed about this they had the formation we reflected and actually when we did that the children just raised their hands and say, yes, my puppy died. Yes, my grandmother died. Yes, I have a friend in my class who died. And I want to talk about it. I want to hear about it. What, what, what is it? How do we face that? How do we live with that experience of losing someone we love? And this is very important. So maybe they don't always express it, but they see so many things. And I, I'm clear that they have so many questions. Erin, is there something you'd like to add on this or any related topic to the this big question about different expectations that different people have? Yeah, when when I think about expectations, I, I often start with what are what are expectations people have around religion? And there's, you know, sometimes uh, perhaps this isn't true just about Judaism, but but sometimes there's a lot of baggage um, about what's considered organized religion. So I, I start from the place that Judaism is very much disorganized religion uh, and kind of undoing some preconceived notions that that religion or faith or spirituality, which are worth unpacking by themselves, um, that they have to mean one thing and that theology has to mean one thing. Uh, and sometimes uh, for people that means, you know, God is God is angry and in the sky and lashing out at people. Um, and how do we, as much as possible, uh, unpack that and offer many ways, whether it's our preschoolers, and I'm looking at a picture right now in my office of preschoolers drawing pictures of what God looks like to them, uh, reading stories that intentionally um, have a diversity of understandings of God, um, voices of God. Uh, whatever that looks like, and and to to really create that disorganization rather than a prepackaged theology as if it's dropped from the sky like a UPS package, uh, and and when kids um, see that modeled, you know, in in conversations that I have with our preschool kids through our confirmation students who are in tenth grade, uh, the tenor of the conversation changes. There's almost this permission giving, like oh. We can talk about that. Um, and there's so much that's infused or reinforced at such a young age that I didn't even realize that um, kids hear a message or it could be the seemingly most insignificant moments around a much larger moment that the, that the kid is paying attention to that word choice or that use of theological imagery. And that becomes you know, the hook on which they hang their theological hat for the next 30 years. Uh, and so I think about that vis-a-vis -vis kids who are coming out in the LGBTQ community, um, people of color in the Jewish community, um, women in the Jewish community, ways in which groups that have been other um, can be part of kind of reconstructing theology, reconstructing religion, um, both healing um, for them, but also I think redemptive for everyone else who's in the process who can kind of undo whatever the normative theology has been for so long and realize, yeah, that's one way in, right? God in the sky theology, that that's one way, but there are many ways. And I think the more voices and experiences that are around the table, um, thinking about the kid who's transitioning genders and and how is that in community? And how does that play out for their parents um, for the or for the adults in their lives? And 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 to recognize that religion in that moment has to be reconstructed um, or it's often discarded and, and never returned to. So I think the challenge is constantly there. 
um, for religious leaders and for us to be in conversation with the real lived experiences in front of us. I think some of Aaron's comments have pointed us towards the second uh, grouping of questions that we uh, wanted to invite you to explore today. And that's thinking about not only what encourages, but what impedes um, caregivers' ability to fulfill this spiritual nurture process. Um, and in particular, you know, what are some what are some ways that parents and other caregivers need to work together to provide um, a spiritual environment and spiritual support for young people? What are practices and rituals? I know Dua, you've mentioned some really small kinds of practices that could happen. Um, what are some of the kinds of things that you really can't transmit? but you can try to foster through the ways that you um, organize family life or you interact with children. Um, Dua, would you mind um, saying a little more on that since you already have shared a few uh, simple kinds of rituals or practices with us? Sure, I, I think the key to all of this is to have a shared narrative, right? And to, I, I like what Brad mentioned earlier about really having that communal, as human beings, we're tribal creatures, right? So when we are together, it seems to kind of reinforce those ideas even more. Um, however, we have to make sure that our young people choose their own paths and their own journeys. I think part of what might impede a, a young person or a teenager to take that spiritual path is when we, we really dictate to them to the letter and to the T exactly what their spiritual journey is supposed to look like. I think it's really important for young people to figure out and to give them that space to figure out what it means to them, right? Like what, how, how they can flavor it in their own ways, but to be able to do it within that communal, communal grounding or, or exercise or space so that they see the different generations around them and, and the differences in how they kind of take on that spiritual understanding. So and that can look like different things. So this program that we do called Family Odyssey, sometimes we go on a hike together, right? Um, sometimes we watch a movie and we have a discussion. You know, it looks like different things, but we're doing it together. Even the actual praying together, in our tradition, praying together like as a group has 27 more rewards than praying individually. And so that kind of reinforces this idea that when you pray together, you reinforce this idea that this spiritual journey is something that's communal. Brad, Elaine, Aaron, um, who'd like to jump in next? Brad. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I would say that this is something that uh, parents almost universally struggled with um, because they had expectations on themselves and um, inevitably um, didn't live up to their own expectations. Um, or they felt like they should have higher expectations and but just don't even have the energy to have them. Um, so there, there um, and even parents who were who are um, very intentional about um, different practices in in their, not only going to um, to worship communally, but also in the daily life of you know prayers and devotions and that sort of thing. Um, most really struggle with it. They even ones who did it um, who had a pretty pretty structured uh, set of practices going on at home often felt like either um, it wasn't enough, or is there are the kids really finding this meaningful? Um, because some days it just, and am I finding it meaningful? <laughs> and there's some days I'm just struggling with, um, you know, having any kind of um, spiritual energy, if, for lack of a better term. So I would point more just to the, the struggle that so many parents themselves felt about. Um, it's not so uh, about their role and it's not so different from their parenting roles that they're all we all struggle with all right how much how much autonomy do you give your kids how much uh do you lay down the law and 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 as they get older negotiating that well that's all going on with the religious life as as well um 
if I may jump in, um, what encourages and, and impedes uh, caregivers and parents' fulfillment of expectations of, of love, care for the child, their well-beings, their growth, uh, especially sick children? Um, I would say um, vulnerability, limitations, uh, imperfection, and maybe the difficulty to accept all those, to accept that uh, they maybe cannot save their child or not, uh, not uh, give as much as they would have liked or not be the perfect parents that they would have liked. Um, so accept and uh, so what encourages and impedes, I think it's a, a little melted, a little complex, but uh, our own vulnerability, our own limitations are, are what are both a richness and a limitation, I believe, are, are both something that prevents us when we don't accept that we're not perfect. Uh, it can prevent us maybe to love more, and at the same time, it's a strength that we touch our vulnerability, but that's what makes us able to connect to others. Um, I would say maybe another point that would be time is a complex reality also, because when a child is sick, uh, time can be very, very long when we see the child suffer, or it can be very short because time is counted and we don't know how much, how long the child will live. And so time is a complex reality and it gives pressure sometimes to the parents, to the caregivers. And maybe lack of knowledge of how to nurture the spirituality, both for themselves and for the child. Um, all those questions, all those uh, overwhelming feelings and overwhelming um, situations that can happen in the daily life that are demanding and the, the want to make the best of it. And maybe sometimes also the guilt not to to be perfect among all those things. Maybe it's a, an intense uh, concentrate of what many parents might live in a daily life more, more, um, more uh, um, uh, uh, spread out to many all kinds of different people. I'm, I'm searching for words, sorry. But um, yeah, so time, uh, vulnerability and uh, need to know more, but not know with the head, know with the heart, know with uh, the experience, know as a wisdom, maybe. As you've responded, I'm wondering if um, there are particular kinds of practices or rituals that over time you found that families gravitate towards or that parents find easier to begin to implement with children or young people. Um, if there's anything that if a parent was going to come to you and say, I don't feel like I'm doing enough, as Brad was saying, many parents feel, you might say, well, here's something you could try. Um, and uh, could tell us a little more about why it is those might be the things that you see or that you would recommend. Erin, um, can I ask you to start with that? Sure, a couple thoughts. One practice that I, I love to recommend is around Shabbat dinner table ritual, uh, that you know having a weekly Shabbat practice on a Friday night as a family does not need to be an elaborate meal. It can be ordering in pizza and sitting around the table and before candle lighting to take a picture of your family and to create a photo album and to be able to mark over a period of weeks or a period of months or years um, how that family has grown as individuals physically, how the family has expanded. Uh, and it prompts really rich conversations looking back on albums. You know, what was going on in our lives at that time? Oh, I remember it was really difficult to get everyone around the table, uh, but it marks time. It makes a record of it. And I think in the chaos of life, uh, it's rare that we get the experience or hold ourselves accountable to say, this time is sacred and we're going to commit to it, even if the content looks different week to week, even if we can't prepare a fancy dinner, um, there's time that we've reserved. And at the very least, we've taken 30 seconds to assemble everyone uh, for a family photo. So I think those moments are really important and rich to record in some way, to have like documentation, to memorialize. Uh, and I think about 
family services much the same way. We often think about um, historically in, in our community, okay, how do we, um, how do we, you know, create a C door? How do we create a prayer book that reaches kids? And that can be meaningful. Um, we tried once having our adult prayer book at a family service um, and found that the kids were really engaged um, because the parents were really engaged. Uh, and what happened though, which often happens is parents, um, some parents complained there was a lot of talking uh, at the service. And I, I looked around and it was um, a holiday service. And we had a repeat service, a similar service the next week. I looked around, it was the parents who were talking. They were apologizing for their kids. Their kids were banging on drums. We kind of, we put kids in the middle of the room and uh, the kids were singing, the kids were dancing. It was the parents who were talking and why? Because they wanted to catch up with each other. They hadn't seen each other in a while. And so there was no guilt, but the parents were very quick to kind of like pass the blame. Oh, my kid was talking. My kid was too loud. My kid was disruptive. I said, no, your kid was doing exactly what they need to be doing at five years old, at seven years old, at 10 years old. And I said like, and it's awesome that you were talking with your friends because you haven't seen them in a while. And I love that our spiritual community can make space for that. Uh, but it's kind of disabusing people of the notion that, again, things have to be organized in the same all the time um, in prayer spaces or in religious spaces, but to say like, how can you show up, whether it's around a Shabbat dinner table or in a service, letting kids be kids and actually sometimes letting adults learn from kids that I don't always need to be looking over my shoulder. I don't always need to be getting it exactly right, but am I in the practice of it and developing a spiritual practice more than a spiritual perfection? Dua, Brad, I, Elaine, more ideas? I see Dua. Sure. I think it really depends on the age of the children. So the younger they are, I think the more positive associations that you can make with a spiritual practice, the more that it kind of gets ingrained in who they are and, you know, their memory base. So like in our tradition, if we go to fire a prayer and take them out for ice cream afterwards, they make that positive association that every time I went to Friday prayer, I remember going out with, you know, for ice cream with my parents or my family. And so as they grow older, they remember that those are the things that, you know, that, that, that feel good, that, that make them happy. Right. But um, I think also as they grow older, um, connecting, uh, that again, that social, that social tribal uh, family connections with prayer. So um, I remember when I was growing up that I used to, it used to really like touch me and emotionally and touch my heart when I used to remember of certain family members that would make certain prayers by name about me. They would know something that I wanted or I needed. And then they would say, you know, they would pray to God and say, you know, could you give this to Dua because this is what she wants? And it used to it used to make me feel really good. So I know that in my family, one one kind of um, tradition that we do is that we have a jar and we kind of fill in these post-its or these little cards of things that we really wish for or really want. And we drop it in the jar because sometimes it can be really self-conscious if you ask someone personally to make a prayer for you. So we drop it in the jar and then we kind of pick from the jar and we have everybody go around and make a prayer for who, whoever put that piece of paper in the jar. Um, and, and so that's a ritual that I know that even my teenage daughters really enjoy doing, making, making a prayer for everyone that's in the room. We also do this thing called an awe walk. So we go out in nature and we look for little things in nature that really make us say wow right like and and to really make that connection with this with with the creator like wow did you see this leaf or this mushroom or this root structure or whatever it is right this is really cool and as they grow older sometimes we take pictures and we make like an album an awe album right and really connecting that wow factor with this idea that the creator made this you know this this is absolutely amazing and awe-inspiring that sounds very cool. I'm going to steal that idea. Um, Elaine, I think you are going to jump in. Well, I'm thinking about um, uh, um, uh, 
I wanted to connect something that uh, with something that Aaron said, but I, I'll go for a little later. I, I was th I was thinking about stories, telling stories, listening to stories, biblical stories, um, religious stories, but also um, maybe magical stories or invented stories. Why not? And I believe that it's important that family can also write their own stories, not necessarily writing with a paper and a pen, but that they can imagine and tell themselves, each members and all together, what is their story and, and how do they participate in it? How do they uh, construct it? How do they make it nice, make it beautiful, make it uh, something that is unique to them and very precious? Uh, that would be one of the suggestions. And having mementos, that's what I, um, I liked and I connected with uh, what Aaron said, having mementos of these personal and family stories that uh, they are telling to each other. I was going to connect to the food aspect of what Aaron had brought up around um, uh, Shabbat. Um, the kids, one of the questions we asked kids was, what do you like most about church? Um, and I would say at least 50% of the kids mentioned food uh, in one form or another. Um, and so what's true for the larger worshiping community, I think is true for home as well, that what happens around table, what happens around food is very both revealing uh, and powerful uh, for, for family members. So even having meals together for one thing, uh, and typically um, if, if somebody were asking me about uh, where to begin, I, I would recommend a simple prayer uh, as well. The other big place that children felt like, um, now this is going back to home life, where, where Actually, the question is, where, uh, where do you often um, feel closest to God? Um, and sometimes it was at church, and sometimes it was associated with food, like uh, dinner. Uh, and the other place was uh, the, my bedroom or my bed. Uh, and I think the intimacy, the vulnerability, Elaine, that you were talking about, all those things come into play. Um, as we're on the edge of sleep. So I think prayer in that context as well can, can be really meaningful. But I also um, wanted to share a little bit what, when I'm asked to do like a workshop with parents um, in, a, in a church setting, um, they will often share. One nice thing to do is just ask people, what do they do? Do they do anything? Uh, what were they like? What have they tried and just utterly failed at? Um, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, but just sharing ideas and sharing um, even the sense of failure, at, uh, not living up to your own expectations, that kind of thing. But one of the things I really enjoy doing uh, with parents is taking a step back. Um, one, yes, promoting some kind of intentional rituals. I, I think that's really powerful for children and for parents as well. Um, but also thinking um, kind of more, um, um, it, I would call it liturgically about your everyday life. So one exercise I've done with parents is where, whatever church I'm in, uh, I'll take their bulletin and look at what's going on in the service. Well, we have a time of prayer, we have communion, we have baptism, we have benedictions, we have praise, we have this, that, and the other. We have confession, we have forgiveness. Uh, and then just ask, how are children in your household learning these rituals that we value? These are what the community says are valuable. So what are your children learning about confession? Is it just something that kids do? Is it something that parents do as well? Uh, what are they learning about forgiveness, uh, about reconciliation with one another? What's happening at table? Uh, what's happening with water? Um, or in my tradition around baptism at all. And that, um, that seems to be liberating for parents. They go, oh, so when I, every night I read a story to my, uh, my three-year-old and uh, I kiss her goodnight and say, God loves you and I turn out the light, that's a, like a benediction. That's a blessing that I'm giving at night. Yeah, yeah, and you do it every night and it's just like, 
you know, the pastor at the end of a service giving a, a blessing. Uh, so think, looking at the ways that their worship lives have actually been shaping their everyday uh, family lives can be very powerful for, for parents and maybe uh, alleviate some of the guilt they sometimes feel. May I add something, uh, Karen Marie? So yes. I was thinking about tradi uh, transitions, how important transitions are. So um, like just a general parenting strategy is, you know, when we're dealing with children in transitions, we, we often collect them, right? When they come from school, we kind of connect with them before they go to bed. We connect with them before we leave the house, we connect with them. So I was thinking part of what might also connect uh, our young people with spirituality is to infuse spirituality within those transitions. So, and and, and it came up when, when Brad was talking, um, you know, when they're leaving the house to remember to ask for protection, for example, or before they go to bed to make a prayer, or when they wake up in the morning and they go to school, you know, all of those transitions, when our mind makes those shift, we make sure that we're very intentional about those shifts so that we infuse that spirituality in between. And I have just one more story on that um, that came from a child who talked about her mother giving her a feather to take to school on the first day of school, her first day of kindergarten. And the feather was really meaningful. It reminded her of home. And uh, she even said it reminded her of God. And But she didn't explain very much. But then we talked to the mother who had given the feather. Uh, and they, um, they had been reading, I think it was Psalm 91, where God is protecting with God's feathers um, um, over, uh, over, in this case, over the child. So the feather was representative of God's hovering, securing um, presence. Um, and, and the mother said, and I told her whenever she feels afraid, just take a look at the feather and that will remind you that I love you and God loves you. Um, so, but it's right to your point, Dua, and it's those, those transitions are so uh, important. Erin, you've mentioned some rituals and practice of things um, previously, but is there anything else you'd like to add around rituals and practices that you would recommend or encourage with parents and children? I appreciate what's been shared already, and it, it brings to mind, certainly on special holidays, giving out uh, a candy bar, uh, something simple, or giving out a book to read um, that becomes part of the family ritual at home. And one of the uh, outgrowths of COVID was doing a milk and cookie story time with the rabbi on Thursday evenings um, at seven o'clock on Zoom, something that would never work in person for, for parents to bring their kids um, for 20 minutes to, to have a story read, uh, but tying in, okay, what's the book that we're giving? Is there a way to reinforce that when we do that event on Zoom? Uh, trying to repeat things uh, and, and noticing that repetition, as I mentioned before, uh, serves a great purpose in, in reinforcement and positive reinforcement. So before we um, wrap up tonight, because we've got uh, about 25 minutes left, um, I want to bring us back around to the sort of existential questions and crises that become a part of children's lives. Um, for some children, this you know begins uh, in infancy because of illness, as um, as Elena started, or comes along at another time. For others, it has to do with um, a new understanding of uh, gender identity that leads to transitions, as Erin has mentioned. Um, and there are just so many other ways in which, uh, you know, with again on the on the sort of uh, far side of a global pandemic that still might raise up and, and create new issues for us or climate change or these other kind of issues that um, raise the anxieties of children. Um, what does spiritual nurture uh, from parents and caregivers look like uh, for these, for children, for children who are anxious and worried about the world in which they live? Um, what advice would you give to parents um, in relation to, you know, sort of keeping pace with children who are in crisis or who are anxious about crises? Erin. 
Uh, I'm happy to begin on this one. Um, you know, I, I love the term keeping pace with. I think it's so important to use. And I think about when when kids come out, um, you know, perhaps instinctually people go to the place, hopefully go to the place in some ways. Oh, that's great. Mazel tov, wonderful. Um, kid may actually not be in that place. Uh, and so really being able to keep pace with what's coming up for them, you know, to affirm and to celebrate, but maybe they're not looking for a party in that moment, or maybe they are. Uh, and and to recognize um, what needs what needs to happen, and uh, how have we kind of done the work, not to get to a place of perfection, but kind of done the work to prepare with our own anxieties, our own internalized homophobia, our own internalized racism, transphobia, whatever whatever is coming up in that moment, so that we can be fully present. Um, we had a kid in our congregation who recently. Um, started using they, them pronouns. Um, and I found out from our youth director, um, but it wasn't clear to me that their parents knew that. And so I really wanted to be careful keeping pace with like, what's this teenager's comfort? What, what do they want versus what do I need? Um, you know, how do I want to signal that I'm you know, a trans ally versus what's actually needed in this moment and what does this teenager need? And they're going off to camp and there's all kinds of stuff coming up for them around camp. So it kind of finding those moments to check in with myself and then situate myself in relationship to um, the, the kid, the preschool kid, the middle school kid, the teenager. And what does a response or relationship with that kid look like and that may be in alignment with the relationship with the parent. It may be, oh, that that parent um, may not be an ally or they may not be an ally yet. How am I modeling through the books that are in my office? Am I showing books visibly about trans identity? Am I showing books visibly about um, mental health, about divorce, about issues that often um, are stigmatized by society? And how do I, as a religious leader, kind of put it very front and center so that no one needs to wonder, a kid doesn't need to wonder walking into my office or a parent wa walking into my office, oh, do I do I share this with the rabbi? Is the rabbi okay with it? Whatever issue it is. And then I think it's the responsibility of faith communities to be as explicit as possible, not as just kind of, you know, kind of performatively, but to truly live this out, both in, in what we preach, what we teach, um, and then building relationships accordingly with, with kids keeping pace with them and with parents and keeping pace with them. Thanks, Erin. Um, Elaine, Brad, Dua, who else would like to talk about the hard stuff that we would hope parents would talk about? <laughs> Elaine? I, I like what Erin uh, just mentioned about the modeling and what was uh, first mentioned again, keeping pace with the children, also with the parents, sometimes I believe that sometimes children show parents how to best interact with them. Um, obviously, we need to listen to that. At the same time, it's it's challenging that we don't make children responsible uh, to their parents or responsible to help their parents because um, this is a complicated thing to, to express in English. Um, it would be sad that roles are reversed and parents are are so so much helped by their children that children parents their their parents that that would be sad that's what i want to just highlight but i think that communally um there can be a, some a, some kind of mutuality when uh, they are helping each other of course if there would not be children, there would not be parents. And in that sense, children are helping parents being parents. And maybe it's the same with more critical situations that we need to, to be aware that we are both learning, both journeying, both uh, on this road. And, and again, not perfect and limited, but capable together and with the transcendent, with God or with something greater than us. I think in general, parenting in general can be very lonely. And then I think parenting with this lens of spirituality can even be more lonely 
because sometimes in the context of this modern world that we live in and a lot of the 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 struggles that a lot of our young people are going through and the transitions that they're going through sometimes it can feel like parents are like I don't know what to do and I don't know how to do this in the context of this modern world and so I think it's really important for us to create those spaces where parents are having those conversations with one another and almost coaching one another in terms of I've tried this Maybe if you did this, this would work, you know, or, you know, this really helped my daughter go through this, this, this part, but, but also really having this idea or really training young people to understand that the difficulties that they go through on in life, help them grow and help them expand, right? So when we look at weeds growing around plants, desired plants, right? It helps loosen up the soil and it helps the plant grow and helps the, the plant figure out who they are, right? And so to change that lens and that, that mindset of maybe something you think is bad for you or difficult for you is a blessing in disguise. And we have this idea that a believer is lucky both ways or is you know, benefits both ways. When there's difficulty, they're patient and they kind of trudge through it and then they come out victorious. And when 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 things are easy, they're they're a person of gratitude. So in both situations, it works for them. So really instilling that in our young people with whatever they might be going through. But also like Elaine mentioned also is giving parents this chance to have those discussions with one another so they don't feel like they're doing this by themselves. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with what everybody has said. And um, um, when when Aaron, you were talking, um, I was hearing a, a kind of a quality of, of attentiveness to children, but also to parents uh, as well. Um, something that um, that's born of you know a caring relationship uh, with 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 them. Um, in terms of actual advice, uh, I, I don't know if I have a lot of advice for parents, but um, just a connection to some of the things we've been talking about earlier um, around rituals and and, uh, um, um, and context. I mean, I I think there's something uh, really powerful, like having meals together, having a prayer together, telling stories together, uh, reading something together. Uh, um, those are all really important, really um, prime opportunities for listening for, for that kind of attentiveness to hear what's going on. You know, a child prays for somebody else, a kid at school who has cancer or, um, or you read a story about somebody going through something um, and you have a chance to talk about it. Um, it just feels like some of the same things we're talking about for cultivating spiritual nurture generally are also important contexts for being able to address harder, deeper existential issues. Somebody dying, somebody transitioning, uh, somebody in crisis, somebody anxious. Well, and, and, and built into that is a kind of presence with somebody else. So we've got about 15 minutes left, and I want to open up this conversation to questions or comments, or as I put in the chat, um, stories that you might have of parents and caregivers nurturing children that you would be willing to share. So if you have something that you'd like to add to the conversation um, that you haven't already dropped in the chat, uh, please uh, unmute or uh, put that in the chat so that we can expand the conversation to all participants. Is there anyone who'd like to speak into the group? Um, love to have that. Lucinda? Uh, 
Um, very existential question. I could you talk a little bit about uh, caregivers, um, a grandparent in um, interreligious marriages, where there might not be openness to the influence uh, from both sides of the religious uh, divide or, or contrast. So, yeah, uh, what do you do about that feeling of responsibility for spiritual uh, growth in the next generation? That's a good, hard question. Uh, who among our intrepid panelists would like to offer some <laughs> thoughts? Elaine. <laughs> I don't know if I'm intrepid, but um, I, I think it's a, a question that comes back very often, and it's very uh, deep and very uh, serious question. Grandparents have at heart their, their grandchildren, and especially when we were talking about caregivers also, when they are both, it's a challenge, and in a multi-religious context. Uh, in Quebec, we are confronted with um, uh, a very diverse way of being Christian or not being Christian. And for many years, uh, there has been this image that people would be Christian as if they would go to a banquet and they would pick this and that and this and that. And that was very much complained about. And people from the church would say, that's not good at all. You know, you just choose what you like and not what you don't like. And that's not religion at all. And sociologists looked at people and looked at why did they do that? Why are they just picking this and that? What's happening there? And from their point of view, it's a very hard work to do that because people are not just only picking things up. They are trying to make sense of their lives and they are trying to do that with what is available to them. And some parts of religions are not accessible because they don't understand it, they reject it, they are against this or that because of the church or because of other, other kinds of reasons. But they want to make sense and they want to live spirituality. And in order to be able to do that, that's why, well, being quiet and meditate in a yoga way makes sense for me. Okay, I'll do that. And using this practice that belongs to another tradition makes sense to me. Okay, I'll do that. And it's a very hard work of, of threading and uh, weaving meaning with all that is available. And that's what we do with stories. That's what we do. So this long answer is it's to, to perceive that interreligious uh, people that are living in the... Um, in the um, in multiple religious contexts, that's what they have to do as well. They have to weave together what is meaningful to them. And I suppose that the child do the same. So how when, can we participate in this threading? How can we participate in this weaving, respecting and asking and being attentive to what is the work of the other and participating into it? That would be how I could phrase it. Thank you, Elaine. Do yeah, I? If I may add also, I, I think, and a lot of parents approach me asking, just in general, like, how do I ensure that my kids turn out X, Y, Z, right? At the end of the day, we don't control our children. They're not, they're not really ours. You know, we, we model for them that we, 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 we lead we provide the, pro the proper space and environment and framework. But at the end of the day, they have to make their, their path. They have to create their own path. They have to figure out what that looks like and what that feels like for them. And we hope, and, and this is what I tell parents all the time, is we hope that the modeling and the experiences and the frameworks that you've provided for your children give them that sense of spirituality and that path to that higher power. But at the end of the day, what they make it look like or what they create it, create it to be is something they have to own and not something that we have the power to, to, 
to really control. Yes, Noel. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm finding this a very interesting discussion. And uh, I missed the first 15 or 20 minutes, so my question was already dealt with. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, on the one hand, every child is different. And on the other hand, I'm wondering, are there broad classifications that you have in mind as you approach children generally, uh, especially when they're in a group, in order to uh, have some guidance for yourself or perhaps what you would encourage uh, parents and grandparents to, to use. Uh, and there are two sets that come to my mind. Uh, one is the basic distinction between introversion and extroversion where an introverted child may not enjoy group and family gatherings much at all and get much out of them. And on the other hand, an extroverted child may or may not <clears throat> enjoy contemplating things on their own and uh, communing with themselves. That's one of the extroversion, introversion. The other general classification would have uh, three parts. Uh, some people need to be confronted in order for them to make progress. Some people need to be guided, not confronted, in order to make kind of, uh, progress. And uh, the third grouping would be some need simply to be encouraged, neither confronted nor guided, but simply encouraged because uh, in the mind of the adult who is viewing this, uh, they're on the right path already. I'm, so as I say, those are just three general class, uh, two general groupings of classifications. I'm just wondering if those or any others uh, come to mind that you kind of use to sort out especially groups. Who among our panelists might want to address this question of whether there are sort of some characterizations of children that maybe we we are aware of that we use as we uh, begin to interact or or not? And if so, if not, why not? There, there's been some, um, and Karen, I shared some of this with you a while back, but there's been some interesting work. Um, by a couple of researchers named Robert Crosby and Aaron Smith, who have been, um, lately they've been looking at trauma-informed classrooms um, and wondering what principles from trauma-informed therapy in classrooms could be translatable into children's ministries in general. Um, and they found a few things uh, like uh, really, predictability and uh, a calm atmosphere is really helpful for those who have gone through some kind of trauma uh, because unpredictability, uh, it just tips um, the traumatized over uh, pretty quickly. But it turns out, you know, predictability and calm are pretty good things for most children uh, anyway. Um, and, and just supportive relationships, again, back to the kind of attentiveness, uh, being able to read kids um, because, as Noel said, that there's a great variety and all kids are not the same. And some kids, um, for example, are, are, not, are, are all not, not that comfortable with calm and predictability either and will do everything to try to disrupt that. Um, I don't think there's a, a magic answer on that. It's more, uh, it's more an art, probably. I think just like with everything when it comes to parenting, the more that we can get to know our child's personality, the better we can kind of direct them in terms of spirituality. So you might be familiar with Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages of Children. And uh, I found that 
um, technique or that knowledge or base of the love languages of our children, a really great, great segue to introducing them th to spirituality. So if a child's love language is touch, for example, every time I say a prayer or we're, we're doing something, I make sure to hold their hand or really, you know, have that touch sense. If it's quality time, then I'm making sure that I'm really taking them on for a walk or doing those things to remind them with this higher power. So I think with just like with anything, if we use their personality as our gateway to be able to introduce God and the understanding of God through that love language, because in essence, how do we connect young people to spirituality? It's through love. And so if we speak their language and help them understand God through love, I think that's one of the best ways to do it. Russ, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to wrap up. So if you want to drop a comment in the chat, I'm not going to be able to call you forward. But thank you to our panelists. Um, I greatly appreciate um, your wisdom and insights on this topic of uh, whose children are they? What is the role of parents and caregivers in relation to children's spiritual nurture? 